Today on Uncommon Knowledge, why are the French so French? Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Two Views of France. The Marquis de Lafayette, the French fleet saving the day at Yorktown. The Statue of Liberty, a gift from the people of France to the people of the United States. France, our oldest and one of our closest allies. According to this view of France, the rupture between the United States and France over the war in Iraq represented an anomaly and a terrible shock. There is, however, another view of France and on this other view, the rupture over the war in Iraq represented just one more instance in a long and contentious relationship. France, our oldest ally, or France, our oldest enemy. Joining us today, two guests. Robert Paxton is a professor emeritus of social sciences at Columbia University. John Miller is national political correspondent of National Review magazine and co-author of the book, Our Oldest Enemy, a history of America's disastrous relationship with France. French political philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy, quote, I know French anti-Americanism well, a phobic hatred of America conceived of as a region not of the world but of being. He's a French political philosopher after all. Almost of the soul lodged in the heart of my country's culture, close quote. Is a phobic hatred of America truly lodged in the heart of French culture? John? Well, anti-Americanism is a, is a deep part of French culture. Bob? I think there are a few Frenchmen like that, but there are many who are not. Many who are not. All right. Let's um, do, uh, this is television, so this will be extremely compressed, but we're now about to engage in a little more than two centuries of Franco-American history. John Miller, you describe France as our oldest enemy, yet we're all taught that the United States owes its existence, its independence to France. If the French hadn't helped us during the Revolutionary War, we'd still be part of the British Empire. Sir? Well, there's a, there's a story, a popular story in America about, about, uh, about France and Franco-American relations. It is essentially a myth. It does begin with Lafayette and Yorktown, and then it proceeds to the Louisiana Purchase, which is described as the greatest real estate transaction in history in which Napoleon uh, gave vast amount of land to the United States at rock bottom prices to his, to his good friend Thomas Jefferson. Uh, there's the Statue of Liberty. There's, of course, uh, uh, the storming of Normandy um, um, right up to the, to the present day. And, 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 and when, when you see conflict, like we had recently, the recent unpleasantness between the two countries over, over Iraq, a lot of Americans scratch their head and they say, well, well isn't France our, our oldest friend? Have they always been with us? And in fact, that is not true. The, the popular story is told, told in our textbooks, uh, cultivated by French diplomats, and, 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 and many Americans like to be seduced by this myth. This two, the, the, the myth is 200 years of sweetness and light, when right. in, fra in fact it is 300 years of friction and hostility. Give us the revolutionary period. What, what, where, what was the friction during the pre-revolutionary the, uh, pre and revolutionary period? Well, there, there were, before the revolution, there yeah. was a long, a long period of, of the French and Indian Wars of course, so named because the French and Indians were the enemies of the American colonists at the time. And it was during this period when the first articulations of, of American national consciousness, consciousness come into being because Americans are perceiving the French empire as an external threat. And they're, they're beginning not to view themselves as Virginians or, or colonists in Massachusetts, right. but as Americans with, with a common bond. Bob, even before this country was a country, the French were behaving badly toward us. French and Indian Wars trying to the, kick us out of the continent. Well, the French and Indian Wars, uh, it takes two to make a war. And uh, we were trying to kick them out of the continent. And uh, actually, we succeeded. And, uh, and they mostly failed. Uh, they, they hung on in, in, uh, in, uh, in Quebec. But uh, the French and Indian Wars, uh, the French had their Indians, and we had our Indians. And uh, there were some rather ugly stories on both sides. And the ugliest story of all, which uh, I read about as a, as a schoolboy in Longfellow's Evangeline, when the, when the British cleared the French out of, uh, out of Nova Scotia. Uh, 
Uh, I, I just read a book, a review of a new book by a man named Fallager, I believe, who says that 10,000 mostly women and children died in that ethnic cleansing of exposure and starvation, which is the Acadians who got to Louisiana became the Cajuns. So uh, it was a dirty war on both sides, and, and, and we won. And as we discuss the history of Franco-American relations, on to another low moment. We now go to the Civil War. The French supported the secession, the secession of South. Why? That's true. This is uh, uh, Napoleon III was mm -hmm. the Emperor of France at the time. He was the nephew of, of the uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, the one we all know very well. And, and he, had, uh, he, he had a lot of visions about the French Empire and, 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 and what he could do with it in the New World. Like, like, like many people in Europe, he was sympathetic to the South for a variety of reasons, some having to do with aristocratic affinity with Southern plantation owners, a lot of it economic. And he, uh, he wanted to enter the war on the side of the South. He supported secession, but he wouldn't do it without the British. And the British never quite got there. So, so Napoleon did not enter militarily into the war. But he did do one thing. He took advantage of uh, the distractions Americans had among themselves over the war and uh, installed a puppet regime in, in Mexico. This was the first major transgression of the Monroe Doctrine which is the policy President Monroe had set up several decades earlier, saying that uh, the Western Hemisphere is essentially off limits to European powers. This was the first major transgression of that doctrine, which, by the way, was largely set up at, 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 out, out of concern for France. Okay, so France supports the South. Not a good thing to do from the point of view of the United States. And he installs the brother of the Austro-Hungarian Emperor, the Emperor Maximilian, into Mexico who's, uh, what's the brother, was a nephew or something? I think it was the brother. brother well, okay, but anyway. Well, in any event, I remember him chiefly for his king. line just before he was executed by yes. Benito Juarez. He turned to his cook and said, you said it would never come to this, and you see now you were wrong. <laughs> in any event, that is not good behavior toward no. the United States. That's a dreadful story, and I think uh, Miller and Molesky have it approximately right. No, no, Napoleon III was one of the worst bits of news uh, to, to come along. The, the, the trouble with the story is that uh, the British uh, are, doing this, uh, are doing the same thing. The British also want cotton, and they, they, and they, and then they, they the favor British the South. The British do not enter the war on the side of the South because the abolitionist movement in Britain by then is too strong. Is that not correct? That, that's, that's, part not, of it. That, that's a large piece of it. That, yes. That's part of it. But, but what, we're, what we're seeing here, which is characteristic of this book, is to single out the French when, in fact, a number of countries are doing but similar here's, things. Here's the fundamental point, though, Peter, right. which, mm -hmm. is that, which is the French love to talk about Lafayette and Yorktown. We are America's oldest friend. We have always been there for you. They never talk about the Civil War and Napoleon III because they can't. And so well, this, is, this is just forgotten. And 20th century. Uh, and yes. despite all this talk about France's Republican ideals, human rights, democracy, your groundbreaking work, and indeed it is groundbreaking, a real addition to understanding of French history, is on the Vichy regime, in which the painstaking documentary work you established that the Vichy regime, far from trying to protect France against the Germans, was offering the Germans even more than they asked. They were angling for a deal in Hitler's New Europe. Is that not correct? I think they were trying to protect France in their way, and they thought they were going to do a deal. They thought they were, had assets to offer, and that uh, they would, uh, that this was uh, definitive. Hitler had won, and they would make a place for themselves in the new Europe. They would benefit from the decline of the British Empire. And they thought they would do a deal, which was uh, a very crass thing. Can I just ask, Bob, the, uh, Germany has come clean in the post-war period, in these decades since, and faced up to the pretty good job, wouldn't you say, facing up I to think they've done, I history. think they're, 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 they're done Have the French faced job. their own history? I think they have. They have, do? I think they have. I think it took a while. I think it took until the 70s. Uh, but but uh, the, the Germans have their Institute for Zeitgeschichte, their contemporary history uh, group, uh, with distinguished historians who are looking things and uh, things honestly, and the French the French, too. Well. the French have a contemporary history group and a book group, group of younger historians doing a, a clear eyed honest job, and they're teaching it in the schools, and in the 90s they tried two Frenchmen for war crimes. Mm. And so I think they've okay. come pretty clean. Uh, but it took them a long time. It took them a no? long time. Right. Uh, Mitterrand was... Next, how did the French behave during the Cold War? The great struggle of the second half of the 20th century, the Cold War, how did the French equip themselves? 
Well, they were unreliable allies during the Cold War. Charles de Gaulle was president for much of this period, of course, and I think a lot of Americans who uh, remember him uh, understood him as a, as a pompous, uh, a very difficult man who had very difficult relations with the United States, was a constant critic of, of, of the United States, of its culture, of, of the way it exerted force around the world. Mm -hmm. um, pulled out of NATO. Interesting story. Right? Yes, pull, interesting story. Uh, when, when very recently we've had boycotts of French products, uh, these ad hoc boycotts inspired by personalities and so forth. People say they're going to stop buying French wine, they're going to stop buying French products right. over Iraq. When, when, when de Gaulle pulled out of NATO, when he made some efforts to destabilize the American dollar in the late 1960s, Americans reacted in exactly the same way. There were these, there were these attempts to boycott people in Congress were talking about it. They didn't invent freedom fries back then, but, but it was the same kind of controversy. But I think that uh, Americans uh, misunderstood de Gaulle uh, uh, profoundly. Uh, de Gaulle practiced a kind of uh, real politique that's, uh, that's offensive to a lot of Americans, but a strong America was an essential part of his poker game and he depended on it. That might seem cynical to us, but when we were in difficulty, he always sided firmly with us. He was the firmest ally during the Berlin Troubles in 1961. He was the firmest ally during the Cuban Troubles in 62. Macmillan went a little wobbly in 61. There, there was, so a, very, uh, there was a very famous story of, of uh, de Gaulle being briefed about the missiles in Cuba. I think it was Dean Acheson, but maybe it was somebody else. Adley Eminent, Stevenson. Adley Stevenson, uh, I'm almost sure. Maybe, I'm not, right. I'm not sure, but some eminent, over. Some eminent over. personality went over with the pictures and said, Mr. President, we have these pictures. And and, would, and we wanted to show it to you. And no, says De Gaulle, the word of the President of the United States is enough for me. And then there was the period when he was... You know, you know what? He yeah. did look. After that meeting was over, <laughs> is that true? after that meeting was over, uh, they brought the pictures in and showed him. This, uh, is, this is part of the mythology. I was all, this is a great anecdote. John was, Kerry told that story yeah. again and again <laughs> during the campaign. He said, "This is how our wonderful relationship with France used to be with Charles de Gaulle, this very pleasant gentleman who trusted America." He's and not that a anecdote is, 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 is that's only half of the but story. Not look at the gentleman. pictures. But, but let me let me. Uh, it is just half the story because I haven't finished my analysis. The de Gaulle was playing this complicated game when the Americans need. Him, he was there. Other times he wanted to show his elbow room. This is a country that had been defeated in 1940, that had been defeated in, in China, defeated in Algeria. De Gaulle has a mutinous army on his hands. He has to show the French people that their country still matters. So he does this flexing of elbows and speaks out and annoys us. And it's a way of expressing okay. his independence. Can I just say, I this, I think is, this is actually an absolutely serious. critical point. Absolutely critical point. One reading of de Gaulle is that in the great moral struggle of the last half of the 20th century, he failed to choose sides decisively. He was with the United States overall because he wanted France to be free of the Soviet Union, but whenever he could, he would try to cut slack, use sharp elbows, and work against the United States. He was a free rider on our defense and diplomacy holding NATO together. The other view is that he had very serious problems with the communists in France itself and that he had to define his policy against the United States to a large extent in order to keep France in the free world, to keep the communists from becoming as much of a force in France as indeed at certain points they did become in Italy. To which do you subscribe? I subscribe to the, to, to the first of those two views. I don't think his uh, most serious problem was the communists. There's, there's no... Uh, 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 so John, he wasn't John, a moral bastard. John, John, <laughs> John, his most serious problem were, were the officers, army officers who were trying to kill him because he had... He because had stopped, of Algeria. He stopped the war in Algeria, which was a, which was a mark of great realism. Monsieur. And it was good for the, us in the Cold War. That was a terrible... Now to recent history, the Iraq War. The current critical rupture, the disagreement between France and the United States over Iraq. The United States does indeed take the matter to the United Nations, yet France derides us for unilateralism. We spend months laying out the arguments, yet French Foreign Minister Dominique de Villepin argues that, quote, nothing, nothing justifies envisaging military action, close quote. They thwarted us, they were obstructionist, they did nothing but cause trouble, correct? Yes, that's absolutely true. And, and my, one of my points is this, is this is the last in a long episode of, of difficult periods. I mean, President Chirac is a Gaullist. He is a neo-Gaullist. His, his behavior is very much like uh, what Charles de Gaulle's was. And, and right now, there, 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 there's a powerful idea in, in, in French culture and politics that, that the United States is not just the lone superpower in the world, but it is a hyperpower. 
This is their word. That French phrase, hyperpuissance. Right, and hi the prefix hyper, they mean they, they they intend for it to have all the negative connotations. Not, not really. Associated. There are supermarkets no, called hypermarché. They, they, they mean they mean out of control. Yeah. It is a power that needs to be constrained, and they view France's purpose in the role to, to do, what in the world extent, today. So Bob, to what extent does the French opposition to the war in Iraq derive from French domestic politics? The population in France of Muslims is now five million, about eight percent of the French total population mm -hmm. is a larger proportion than any other major Euro Western European country. I think it derives from the domestic politics, all right, but I think it reflects French public opinion, non-Muslim public opinion. Uh, the French uh, thought that uh, the war was uh, going to war in Iraq was an extremely bad idea. I mean, I mean there were certainly some self-interest involved. Uh, they probably wanted to collect some of their debts, but uh, their, uh, this, is, this responds to French public opinion, which is not different from most of European public opinion, which was that it was a bad idea for the same okay. reasons that Bush Sr. didn't go in, which was it would divide, likely Hang blow on. the country into three parts, bring in Iran and Turkey. You just said that French public opinion is not too different from European public opinion. Consider this. Britain, Spain, Italy, Poland, Hungary, all support the war in Iraq. In Germany, Gerhard Schroeder opposes the war, but leaders in the opposition party in Germany make a lot of noise, making it clear that they think this is a terrible mistake, that they still want a very firm alliance with the United States, and that had they been in power, they would have supported the war in Iraq. Only in France, among the major Western European countries, do you have both part, the total political spectrum. Chirac is, after all, the conservative leader, and he's anti-American. Let alone, the left is also. The point I'm trying to make is that France is distinctive in its anti-Americanness, in the thoroughness, the purity of its anti-Americanness. Why? What makes the French different from I don't the think Europeans? That's so, by the way, but the public. You, you said these countries support the war. Their governments support the war. Their their public opinions are in the majority hostile to it, Spanish public opinion, even British public opinion, Polish public opinion. And there is a 20% in France that support the war. John? This, this, bring, this brings us back to the de Gaulle question in an interesting yeah. way, is, is that you, you can make the case that, well, he was reacting to communists in his own country and he had to do these sorts of things to balance. But Bob makes the case that he's re well, reacting to his own army officers. Well, that, that he has domestic concerns and he has to balance these, these, these different uh, uh, powers and during the Cold right. War. Uh, but look at Tony Blair. Tony Blair didn't play any kind of complicated parlor game. He actually looked at domestic opinion in his country, and he probably knew that supporting the United States and involving himself, his own country in Iraq would have been a very difficult thing, and yet he did it anyway. He showed the kind of leadership that we'd like to see uh, we would have liked to have seen De Gaulle. Moral uh, courage. Also Chirac. Exactly. Unless you think it was a bad idea, in which case it takes moral courage perhaps to oppose it. If you think Next, what can be done, what should be done, to restore Franco-American relations? How would you advise President Bush and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice to put the Franco-American relationship back together, or would you, John Miller? Well, they're off to a good start, which is, I thought, I thought Condoleezza Rice's uh, visit to Paris uh, was, was, was successful. During which and she did what? She gave a speech in Paris and, and basically said to the French, it is never too late to join a just cause. Her and line, how did that uh, go down? Uh, them. I thought it was a successful, successful visit. Now, I don't know that they're going to uh, send troops to Iraq. I'm sure they won't, in fact. But um, um, the, the message should be that America is going to do what it thinks it needs to do in its own national interest. And in many, in many cases, the French national interest can be quite the same thing, and they can participate in, in, in a coalition of the willing. On this program not long ago, indeed seated in that very chair, historian Neil Ferguson offered this advice to President Bush. I quote Neil. I would say to President Bush, Mr. President, the French despise you. They treat you with contempt. Do not expect anything from them. Do not expect assistance in Iraq and do not regard them as in any sense your allies when it comes to the Middle East. Close quote. I think that's accurate and I think President Bush knows it. And if you had been seated where you're seated now when Neil said that, what would you have done? Come up out of your chair? Well, I would, I would have said the first half of your reasoning is accurate, and that is that governments, by and large, seek 
uh, to seek to express the interests of their, uh, of their countries and the, the will of their citizens. And that's all that we should expect from France. Uh, we, don't, we shouldn't expect them to, to be our satellites because we help them in, in the two world wars. Uh, they're going to they're gonna do what they think is in their interest. And so uh, our business is to try to engage them in things that are in our mutual interest. And we are working with them, as, as, you, as you say in your book. Uh, the, uh, on the police level, we work together very well. The one person who has been indicted in this country on charges related to 9-11 was given to us by the French police. Mm -hmm. The French are active in Afga Afghanistan, where we've had to move out. And, and they're active in the Balkans. They're active in Haiti. We are cooperating in many areas. One more uh, question. And we can, we can co cooperate in some areas, and in, we, where we can't, I don't think we should let it uh, upset us unduly. Another question about how to understand France historically. There's the argument, Robert Kagan makes this argument, that it's only natural for Europeans to see the war in Iraq differently from Americans in their history, last uh, century. Uh, the use of force leads to pointless slaughter. The First World War did not end very happily for France. A horrible slaughter. The Second World War was not a happy experience for France. Whereas in our history, the use of force tends to work, tends to accomplish concrete ends. Vietnam was a, a fiasco, but in gen, what we did all right in World War II, the use of force works for us. The last 50 years, Europe builds a new Europe, they think, built on international institutions, cooperation, so forth. The French lamb has lain down with a German lion at last. Whereas in our experience during the last 50 years, we've had one reason after another to think of ourselves as standing alone or bearing most of the burden, an uh, increased sense of our own na nationhood. What do you make of that? The French are simply acting as you'd expect them to act based on the last five, six, seven decades of their own experience. Well, I, I, think that's, I think that's absolutely right. The French have had, had an awful 20th century, a million, 300,000 dead in the First World That's That's five times what we lost in the entire Second World War, Atlantic and Pacific theaters combined. And then they had a dreadful Second World War. But they didn't make pacifists out of them. They made pacifists out of the Germans. The, the French continued to, they, they fought for 17 years in the colonies after the end of the Second World War. They, they, in Indochina, in Indo Algeria. In Algeria. They turned out on July 14th to watch their soldiers march by, but they don't want to send them just anywhere. They want to plan very carefully where they use force, which seems to me a wreck. Finally, one last question. These days, does France even matter? John Miller, quote, in the end, it may not even matter whether France is an ally of the United States. As the United States rose to the position of the world's most powerful country, France often has been relegated to the role of a mere irritant, close quote. Does it really matter? The only reason it matters is, is because they can obstruct and harass through organizations like the UN Security Council. I mean, the problem with Iraq wasn't just a failure to cooperate. It was French obstruction and, and harassment in this, in this very forum where they, where they did everything they possibly could to get in the way of what America saw was its, was its national interest. They didn't just sit on the sidelines and say, we think maybe this isn't a good idea, but whatever. They got in the way. They threatened the NATO alliance. They, they attempted to form coalitions with other countries to, to, to oppose this. They, they, were, they were adversaries. I, I think this is very interesting because uh, if you were looking for a real adversary in the, in, Iraq, in the Iraq conflict, it would be Turkey. Turkey prevented us from having the northern front. And is anybody out there boycotting uh, baklava? I don't think so. The Turks, we, we, we just took it. And with the French, it gets our goat. Why? I think we expect too much of them. I think we've got this romantic a tale in our heads that we, the white knight, rode off to save them and they spit in our, in our eye. Well, I think that's uh, the wrong level to put this on. We both seek our national interests and sometimes we agree and sometimes we don't. But they obstructed us a lot less than Turkey or even than Germany. The Germans said we would well, never support you. The French said, well, let's take four more months and maybe we will. Well, well I, Deville kind of firmed up the position, though. <laughs> Turkey, Turkey had its problems, but to suggest they were a bigger thorn in the side of the United well, we States have was, our northern was just, front. I think, not, I think not we, true. We couldn't and, and have one, our northern front. Well, one, one, one of the big conflicts before the, uh, before the war actually began is Turkey requesting defensive equipment That's correct. through NATO. And, the and for the first time in NATO history, it was ignored because the French got in the way. This was a, the this French was, are our cousins. This was, you know why it hurts us, because <laughs> yeah. we expect more of them. Well, we, we, we think we saved
them, and, and, and we, we did it for self-interest. We had this funny idea, and it's also in your well, book. Well, the First World War, we, we did help them. Well, we helped them, but it, but it was in our own self-interest, and also in the Second World War. We, we took us three years to get there, and we did it because the Germans had, were, were playing around with Mexico, and they were sinking our ships. We, we don't help them out of charity. We help them out of interest, which is why they helped us in the American Revolution. Let me put this to you. Prior to the terrorist attacks of 9-11, Polls indicated that more than three quarters of the American people held a favorable view of France. By 2003, that proportion had fallen to just one stinking third. Two thirds of Americans hold an unfavorable view of France. Five years from now, a year into the administration of a new president, George Bush will be gone. If, to the extent that Bush himself is the irritant, he won't even be there anymore. Five years from now, what proportion of Americans will hold a favorable view of France. Bob? I have no idea, but let me give you a historical parallel, and that is 1966. Uh, General de Gaulle withdrew from the, from the United Command, not from NATO, but from the, from the military command. From the military Which command. is an important part of it. Uh, two years later, uh, uh, Nixon was elected president and Henry Kissinger, and they admired the real politique of de Gaulle. They thought an independent, strong France was better for us in the Cold War than a weak, the weak forked republic had been. And de Gaulle needed to come closer to us. Nixon needed to come closer to de Gaulle, and they hit it off. Uh, the uh, approval ratings went up. That's one possibility. I have no idea where we'll be in five years, but it's been a roller coaster ride, and it could happen again. John. It has been a roller coaster ride. There's a history of Americans forgetting the animosity between the two countries. But I'll answer your question. I'll say 40%. 40%. It'll inch up a, a bit. All right. <laughs> Bob Paxton, John Miller, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address, comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about Uncommon Knowledge, please visit our website, www.uncommonknowledge.tv. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation.